أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصين عماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته وودد بالسخور ميدان أرضه والصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا الممجد بشيرنا المصدق نذيرنا المؤيد المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين الذين قال عنهم الرسول اللهم إن هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاصتي وحامتي لحمهم لحمي ودمهم دمي يؤلمني ما يؤلمهم ويحزنني ما يحزنهم أنا حرب لمن حاربهم وسلم لمن سالمهم وعدو لمن عاداهم ومحب لمن أحبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فاجعل صلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك ورضوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم ومبغضيهم ومنكر فضائلهم ومناقبهم من أول يوم ظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين اللهم ارزقنا في الدنيا زيارة الحسين وفي الآخرة شفاعة الحسين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته How interesting to see that we are going green, green deen, subhanallah. I remember in the olden days in Africa, we used to have metal cups, if you remember. Uh, and we used to eat from the thali, and we used to drink from the metal cups. And then, of course, the advancement took place, and we came into foam cups, and now we are going back to where we were. That is retro introspection, by the way. That is called reflection. Because when you tried something, it didn't work, you go back to your old style. And that is how reflection takes you to perfection. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I hope we do adhere to this uh, wonderful initiative that has been initiated by the youth of the community. And inshallah, Riyaz, tomorrow, give me a cup so I bring it to the mosque. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah. 
There is a Sufi tale that says there was once a nightingale singing a beautiful song. The nightingales have a very beautiful voice. And it was singing in the branch of the tree. The hunter got distracted by this wonderful singing bird and captured it. As it captured it, it took it home and it put it in a golden cage. After a day or two, the bird lost the zest of singing. She couldn't sing anymore. It couldn't sing anymore. There was no beautiful voice. There was no nothing coming out of her. The hunter went and started chatting with the bird and said, Oh bird, what has happened to you? Why don't you sing anymore? I brought you to this cage in the first place because of your beautiful voice. What has happened to your voice? And the nightingale said, I have lost the will to live. I do not want to live anymore. And the hunter said, but why? Have I not given you this golden cage? Don't I provide you with all the comfort and food that you require in this world? She said, well, I don't feel like living anymore. And he said, but why? So the nightingale said to the hunter, go to my partner who is there on the branch maybe and ask, why is it that I'm feeling this way? And the hunter went back to the forest and he found a nightingale on the branch and said, your friend has sent me to ask you the question that she has lost the zest of living. She has lost the beauty of life. She has lost the voice of singing. And what may be the reason? The bird heard this, fell on the ground and died. The hunter went back home, went to the bird and said to the bird, it was a very strange, amazing moment. And the bird said, but what is the reason that you're telling me this? And what happened? And the hunter said, as soon as I said to your partner that you have lost the will of live, of life, and you have lost the will of singing, it fell down and it died. The soonest, as the bird heard this in the cage, it too fell down and died. The man cried and he wept. He opened the door of the cage, removed the bird and put it on the side. The moment that happened, the bird flapped its wing and flew away. The moral of the story. What is the moral of the story? We too are caged in our world. There is golden cage that we are engulfed in. And this is the world that we are caged into. We are caged with everything and all the wealth that we have in this world. Just today, we were reading somewhere that a president's trip could cost no less than a hundred million dollars just to go and see a few animals in Serengeti and Mikumi. This is the amount of wealth that we are surrounded by and caged into. The requirement is that until we do not understand our own life and until we don't cut short our own life in this cage, we shall lose the zest of living. We shall lose the zest of singing. We shall lose the beautiful, beautiful taste of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why it is required for me and you to liberate ourselves from the cage of existence, from the prison of existence, from this everyday life of routine which is taking me here and there. For even sometimes the life of false religion. The life of religion that we so much are attached to, which sometimes don't even make sense to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created me and you for a purpose. And that purpose is initially to understand yourself. As I said the other day, two most important days in my life. One, the day I was born. And second, the day I find out why. I was born. It is no accident. It is no chance that I am in this world. It is no chance that I am speaking to you today. It is no chance that you are listening me today, to, to me today. 
the Holy Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says law araftum Allah haqqa ma'rifatihi religion by the way religion in simple definition is relationship of man with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's it that is why in Nahjul Balagha, Imam Amirul Mu'minin salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi says what? He says, Awwaluddin ma'rifatuhu. The first thing in a religion is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your creator. And the Prophet says, Law araftumu Allah haqqa ma'rifatihi. Oh man, the Prophet says, if you would have known your Lord in its truest essence and form, which may be impossible, which may be impossible because of the impediments and the veils there are between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you would have known the ma'rifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lamma shaytum ala al-buhur, you would have walked on the sea. وَلَزَالَتِ بِدُعَائِكُمُ الْجِبَالِ And mountains would have crumbled by your dua and by your voices and by your supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. Rumi wrote a very beautiful poem here and I think I said it in one of the lectures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't misunderstand me, just try and understand it in a bigger picture. Allah is like water. Fluid. He is everywhere. Everywhere. Rumi says, Water said to the dirty, Come here. Water said to the dirty, Come here. The dirty said, I am ashamed. The dirty said, I am ashamed. Water replied, How will your shame be washed away without me? How will your shame be washed away without me? And that is where we, we wish to begin tonight. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my God, my Allah, is not a monster Allah. He is the kindest, the most merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there can be. Ever. Allah, my Allah, is just like a mother for a wounded child. Allah is food for the poor. Allah is clothes for the naked. Allah is peace for the troublesome people. Allah is Allah. And that is why yesterday I narrated this hadith Qudsi to you in which Allah says, خَلَقْتُ الْأَشْيَاءَ ajlik." I have created this whole universe, these things, everything for you. وَخَلَقْتُكَ ajli. O son of Adam, I have created you for me. And how did Hussein ibn Ali respond to him? He said to Allah, O oh Allah, if this is the case, then أَيْتَمْتُ عَيَالِ لِكَيْ أَرَاك I have orphaned my kids and my children so that I come and have union with you. And look at Bibi Zainab the way she said, Allahumma taqabbal minna hadha al-qurban. Oh Allah, accept this sacrifice from us to you. That is because Imam Hussein, Bibi Zainab, the 72 martyrs of Karbala had completely dissolved with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Completely. There was nothing of themselves but that they were with Allah. But in order for me to reach my Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have got to fly from this cage of prison. I have got to deal with my arrogance and my ego and my pride. I have got to deal with my greed, with my jealousy, with my hatred, with the hell that I have created within me. I have got to get rid of this. And then reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says, Man ata'a Allah azza wa jal 
فَقَدْ ذَكَرَ اللَّهِ He who obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has simply, simply remembered Allah is God conscious. And then he says, وَإِنْ قَدْلَتْ صَلَاتُهُ وَصِيَامُهُ وَتِلَاوَتُهُ لِلْقُرْآنِ Even if his salat and his siyam and his recitation of the Qur'an is at a minimal. At a minimal. In the holy month of Ramadan, we all know it is highly, highly recommended that we recite the holy Qur'an. True? That we finish one sipara a day 30 times. We finish the Holy Quran on the end of Ramadan. And here I remember the uh, hadith and khutbah of Nahjul Balagh of Imam Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam in, says, in which he says that was out of sync. One more. Sayati ala nasi zamanun la yabqa fihim min al Quran illa rasmu. There shall come a time on the people, Imam Ali says, that nothing of the Qur'an will be remaining except the rasm of the Holy Qur'an. Someone dies, Yasin. Someone's wedding, Surah Mulk. Someone's this, Surah this. I've got jinn in my head, Surah Tul Jinn. I've got that problem, Surah Nur. I've got this problem. Nothing of the Quran will remain except the rasm of the Holy Quran. The substance will not be made, seen. And that is why the Holy Prophet says, even if your salat is minimal, even if your siyam is once only once a year, that is 30 days in the, in the holy month of Ramadan. By the way, it is highly recommended to fast on Thursdays. But even if someone fasts only for 30 days in the month of Ramadan. But if he has got the ma'rifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he is in union with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says he is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ عَسَ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ نَسِيَ اللَّهِ He who disobeyed Allah. Who didn't care about Allah. He has forgotten Allah. وَإِنْ كَثُرَتْ صَلَاتُهُ وَصِيَامُهُ وَتِلَاوَتُهُ لِلْقُرْآنِ Even if he recites thousands of siparas of the Holy Quran, even if he recites 50 rakat of namaz, it doesn't matter. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallamu alayhi had a neighbor, a Jew neighbor, and another Muslim neighbor. And that Muslim neighbor somehow converted this Jew. You see, this is another issue. Conversion. Sometimes we concentrate on converting people. We want you, a Christian and a Hindu and a Buddhist, to come to our religion. Whereas the Holy Prophet himself says, Wama alayna illa Just go and preach. By your actions. And they will automatically come and ask you questions and then be prepared to answer them. With your actions, through your actions, you will bring them closer. This man converted him. He says, right, from tomorrow I'll come and wake you up for namaz Shab, 3 o'clock in the morning. Fine, he woke up. 3 o'clock he went, knocked on the door. Please, namaz Shab, I Allah, I'm Muslim, alhamdulillah. Went, recited namaz Shab. And then he said, now it is time for Salat al-Subh. Recited Salat al-Subh. He said, okay, since we have been here, we have not eaten, drunk anything, let us fast for the day. No problem. We will fast for the day. Let's go home. You know, let me go home, rest for a while, and then at 9 o'clock I'll go to the office. He said, no, it is makruh to sleep after the sun has risen. Makruh. Okay, so what do I do? Do tilawat of Quran. Inna Quran al-Fajri kana. You see? So he said, okay, how do I recite? He says, just recite Alhamd and whatever I recite with you. Nine o'clock he went to the office. He worked all day. The guy comes, Zohar Asar time namaz tayari. Now listen, before Zohar Asar, there are eight, eight rakats of nafila. So we've got to do that as well. Oh, subhanallah. Okay, we did it. And then he goes, iftar time. He says, forget iftar first, let's go pray namaz. 
There is nafila of Maghrib, there is nafila of Isha after Isha, and then after that, we will recite a short dua, and then we will go and sit for Sehri, Iftari. And after Iftari, recite a few verses of the Quran, do dua and go to sleep. Three o'clock, I'm coming back for the same routine. <laughs> Says, okay, sir, no problem. The next morning he came up. Ah, brother, let's go to pray. Say, what pray? I'm not a Muslim anymore. <laughs> what are you saying? I don't want to pray. This is not it. Following namazes and the Quran and du'as and those without meaning and understanding has got no meaning whatsoever in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Absolutely. Allah says, Ya Rabbi, this dua which we recite in dua iftitah, innaka tad'uni fa'uwalliya mink. Oh God, you call me towards you and I run away from you. I just go away. Allah says to Janabi Musa in Surah Taha, Ya Musa, aqimi salata li dhikri. Musa, remember, when you establish namaz, when you pray, you have to have one intention. And that is qurbatan ila Allah ta'ala for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. Yet what do we concentrate on? I'll give you a debate that happened in the Hawza when I was studying in Qom. This, is, this discussion is there in the book called Al-Urwatul Wufqa. For those who know this book, you know that when you reach a certain stage of fiqh, it is where you start studying this book. Urwatul Wufqa. We were studying this book. In this book, there is a discussion on the qiraat of salah, recitation. Of course, qiraat is an important part of salat, very important. Don't joke with it. And the discussion goes, that when you recite Surah Al-Hamd in Salah, you say Bismillah rahman rahim whatever. And then when you reach the verse, Iyyaka na'budu wa Iyyaka nasta'een. So you've got to make a pause. You say, Iyyaka na'budu wa Iyyaka nasta'een. Okay? Na'bud means we worship you. Nasta'een means we seek from you only. Okay? Just you. So that this debate was, why do we need to put a stop on Iyaka? Why? Why? So the scholars, my teachers, my Ustad, Ayatollah said, Ahmad al Madadi, may Allah protect him. He was sitting there and he said, I'll tell you why. Because the scholars of the old school of thought said that during the time of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, In the Kaaba, there were no less than 300 idols. Out of those 300 idols, there were many names, Lat and Uzza and whatnot. And there were two names, Kana' and Kanas. Do you see this? Kana' and Kanas. So the scholars have now recommended that in order for you to go and pray, you have got to avoid taking these idols' names. So if you say, Iyya kana abudu, Iyya kana sta'een, you are saying kana and kanas, you've got to make a stop. So I posed the question. And I said, Sayyid, my purpose and my objective to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that I only have Allah in my mind. Is that it? Because when I pray, I pray for who? I pray to Allah. In the event that I want to avoid these two idols, and when I recite it this way, I am already thinking of these two idols in my namaz. I am already thinking of these two idols in my namaz. True? So whatever you say, I am going to pray like, Iyyaka na'budu wa Iyyaka nasta'in. That's it. And when we see some of the things that are there, we've got to make a stance and say, we need to know if this makes sense or not. Otherwise, we will be doing things that are just there. This example, I love this example. I've got to give it to you. And you have heard it several times, but hear it from my mouth today as well. Layla and Majnu, you know how it is. And we have many Laylas and many Majnoon in this world as well. Of course. And so it should be. 
And when you go home, inshallah, you remember my second majlis. Go tell your wives, we don't do muhabbat, we do. We do ma mawaddat with you. We have internal love with you, not external love with you. There will be no divorces in the community. Inshallah ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Layla and Majnoon. Wonderful story. Go Imra'ul Qais, his name was in Arabic. They call him Majnoon. Even today he's known as Majnoon. He was in the desert and he was walking barbat, completely finished and highlighted in the love of Layla. Finished. He was asking God for either Layla or death. In fact, even death could not touch him in front of the love of Layla. And over there he saw a sheikh praying. He saw a ah, sheikh brain. And during those days, and even today, some of these schools of thought say that, you know what, when I'm praying, do not pass in front of me because it breaks my salah, as if God was sitting at a distance. <laughs> so the man was praying, and Majnoon passed by in the love of Layla, completely lost in this world, not knowing what is on the right, on the left, behind, and in front. And as he passed by, the sheikh finished the prayers and called him and said, how rude. He said, what did I do? He said, you passed by whilst I was praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Majnoon posed the question, Sheikh, oh Sheikh, answer my this question. In the love of Layla, if I could not realize someone was praying here, how could you have realized that I am passing here in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How? When you are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should not have anything and anybody in your mind but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you go further, you will see several examples in the books of history of Amirul Mu'mineen, of Janabi Yusuf from the Holy Quran. When Janabi Yusuf was unleashed from the door, and when he walked in and when the women saw Yusuf, ha, the malakun kareem, they said, this is not a human man, this has to be an angel. And they were given an apple and a knife. And while cutting the apple, they even cut their fingers with it, not realizing that blood was dropping from the fingers. And as soon as Yusuf disappeared, they said, oh my God, we've cut our fingers. How did this happen? This happened because of the beauty of Yusuf. They were lost in that beauty. That is the exact, exact loss that is required when I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when I sit and I discuss with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is exactly what I need to have. <laughs> this salah that we pray have types and types. This salah. I'll give you four today. Increase in my knowledge. I researched it. Number one, it is called Salatul Tifl. Salatul Tifl means what? I'll pray and I'll get this. I'll pray and because of my prayers, I'll get this. This is called Salatul Tifl. Today, everybody is walking on the doors. Halloween, meh, Mubarak, give us sweets. Go greet, you'll get a sweet. Come pray, you'll get something. Salatul Tifl, child's play. Two, Salatul Rushd, a salat with a bit of understanding. And that you link it to the Holy Quran's verse, Inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. Salah actually really, really stops me from doing anything bad. That's a guarantee because it is there in the Holy Quran. If it does not make me do, it does not stop me do anything bad, then I've got to reevaluate, introspect, reflect, and then evaluate myself and say, but how is it possible that my salat is not stopping me to do bad things? This is called Salatul Rushd. And then there is Salatul Unts, the salat in which one seeks pleasure. Pleasure. When you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you raise your hands, you get that inner pleasure. And that is called Salatul Unts. There is a deeper salat to this, my brothers and sisters. And that is called salatul qurb, the salah of nearness, the salah of oneness, the salah when you and him are together. 
And here, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi says, Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu lillahi wa huwa sajida. The closest the slave of Allah can get to Allah is in the state of sajda. In the state of sajda. Raza Sirsawi says, sajda insan ko khaliq se mila deta hai. Sajda insan ko khaliq se mila deta hai. Sajda asrar ke pardo ko utha deta hai. Sajda peshani ko mehtab bana deta hai. Sajda ho piyas mein to aur maza deta hai. Sajda ho piyas mein to aur maza deta hai. Shart itni hai ke bas dil se ada ho jaye. Shart itni hai ke bas dil se ada ho jaye. Sajda jis khak pa ho khak ke shifa ho jaye. Sajda jis khak pe ho khak ke shifa ho jaye. Once janab Musa said to Allah, Kaleem of Allah, speaking to Allah, he said to Allah, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Aqareebun anta faunajik, am ba'idun faunajik. Oh Allah, are you close to me that I whisper to you? Or are you far away from me that I call upon you? Where are you? Where are you? And Allah says, فَإِنِّي his Musa further says, فَإِنِّي أُحِسُّ سَوْتَكْ وَلَا أَرَاكْ Because he used to speak to Musa. Musa says, Ya Allah, I can hear your voice, but I cannot see you. And Allah says, أَنَا خَلْفَكْ I am behind you. وَأَمَامَكْ And I am in front of you. وَعَنْ يَمِينِكْ And on your right. وَعَنْ شِمَالِكْ And on your left. Ya Musa, and listen to this. This will make your heart shake and tremble. He says, "Ana jalisu abdi hina yadkurni." I am a companion of my servant, of my slave, when he remembers me. Wa ana maahu ida daani, and I am with him when he prays to me. O Musa, try me out. Come to me. You know when a person dies, there is a hadith, a qudsi, that I read. When someone dies, Allah says to the angels, go bring him to me. Go bring him to me. And the angels say to Allah, Ya Allah, he has got many things that he has. He has got a ring that he used to take it to the haram of Abu Abdullah and do this, whatever. What about that ring? He says, give it to the heirs. He has got that holy thing. He said, give it to their heirs. He has got that holy thing. He says, give it to their heirs. Bring him to me the way I sent him to this earth. I just want him for myself. The most merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most merciful, forgiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why yesterday I put a point forward and I said every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. And the future of the sinner is complete forgiveness if tawbah and return to Allah is serious. If tawbah is serious. If we fly from this cage of existence, if we die like the bird died and when it was taken out of the cage, it flew. And when it flew, it saw the world from the top. It will never go back into that cage. Never. It will stay where it is. Subhanallah. The Holy Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says, you know how to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not by namaz and salat and zakat and this only. He says, حينَمَا وَصَلْتَ إِلَى الْحَرَامِ تَذْكُرُ اللَّهِ When you reach towards haram, when you go towards haram, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember that someone is watching over you and he is the most merciful, forgiving creator of all. 
in the dua of, of Abu Hamza Thumali. Just a few extracts. I may take five minutes of your time extra if you don't mind. And for that, I need to hear a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think this, uh, this uh, uh, salawat was for 10 minutes. <laughs> Another loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala <laughs> He says, Ilahi wa sayyidi wa izzatika wa jalalik. O my master, O my lord, by your might and your glory, la in talabtani bi zunubi, la utalibanna ka bi afwik. If you hold me by my sins, I shall hold you by your mercy. And if you put me to the pits of hell, I will inform the inmates of hell of my love for you, Ya Allah. And then, listen to this, Allahu Akbar. Just Imam Zainul Abidin can speak to Allah like this. He says, Ya Allah, Ilahi, in adkhaltani nar, fa fi thalika surura aduwik. Oh my Lord, if you put me to the pits of hell, in that your enemies will become happy. Wa in adkhaltani al jannah, fa fi thalika surura nabiyik. And if you put me in the heaven, in that your prophet will be happy. And then he poses a question. He says, Wa ana wallahi, I by, by Allah, by my Lord, I know anna surura nabiyik ahabbu ilayka min sururi aduwik. That the love and the likeness of your Prophet is more beloved to you than when your enemies are happy, Ya Allah. Where will you put me? Where? Rumi says, There was a rose garden once. I was sitting in a rose garden. I wanted to pluck a rose and I got frightened that the Lord of the garden will come and tell me, how did you take this rose without my permission? And I heard a voice saying to me, oh Rumi, take the whole garden. What is a rose? What is a rose? And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has given you and me life, not only life. We have denied him. We have sinned against him. We have refused him. We have ch chucked him out of our houses. We have done everything for, to him. Yet, yet, he says to you and me, just for a second, turn to me and see how I will treat you. Just turn to me. Just turn to me. Just come to me. Tonight is the seventh night of Muharram. Narrations are there for us to see that on the seventh day there was no water in the tents of Hussein ibn Ali. There was no water. It was already surrounded by the enemies of Yazid. Children were thirsty. There was voices, there were voices coming out of the tents. Al-Atash, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. The enemies could hear the voice, but there was no water in the tents. From seventh day, seventh day, seventh night, eighth day, eighth night, ninth night, ninth day, day of Ashura. There is no water. Children are burning with thirst. It is hot in Karbala. And there is no water. My salutations to the mothers of Karbala. My salam to the mothers of Karbala. Especially Umm Farwa. For you know there is a special stark reality of Janabi Farwa. The reality being that she was the widow of Hassan ibn Ali. And not only that, the only thing she had with her was her son Qasim. That's it. She did not have anything else with her but her son Qasim. She had, of course, lots of hopes for Qasim. Lots of hope for Qasim. He will, inshallah, one day grow up. I will see my son, a grown man, a fine man, a warrior in the way of Allah, I will get him married too. Umm Farwa. 
It is a difficult situation for Umm Farwa because she had nobody but Qasim. Do you know how many bodies were trampled on the day of Ashur? Either Imam Hussein والسلام, or it was Janabi Qasim. And there is one more difference. The body of Hussein was trampled after he died. But the body of Qasim was trampled while he was still alive. The son of Hassan ibn Ali on the night of Ashura is being discussing this event with the mother of Farwa. And the mother says, O oh Qasim, remember my son. Remember, I am Umm Farwa. I might be from the Ummati, but I have love for Hussein ibn Ali as my Imam. My husband Hassan ibn Ali has told me to obey my Imam at all times and there is danger on his life for my son. I would want you to sacrifice your life for Hussein. Janabi Qasim is listening to her mom, his mom and saying, Yes, mother, I promise you that I will not let you down and I shall not let my father Hassan ibn Ali down and my grandfather, the Holy Prophet. On the day of Ashura, the situation is such that Imam Hussein is bringing bodies upon bodies upon bodies from morning. Sometimes he brings bodies of Hur, body of Ausa, Muslim ibn Ausaja, bodies of Hurair Hamadan, Burair Hamad. All the bodies he was bringing back to the tents. The time now was that he was now bringing the body of Aoun and Muhammad. He was bringing the body of Ali Akbar. He was bringing the bodies of Bani Hashim. This was the state of Hussein. He was all in blood when he was bringing the bodies. And the ladies in the tents were wailing and crying. Wa Husayna, wa Qasima, wa Abbasa, wa Akbar. Imam Hussein alayhi salatu is standing on the plains of Karbala. Qasim goes to Imam Hussein and says, Oh my uncle, do you grant me permission to go to the battlefield? Hussein ibn Ali, just imagine this picture. A 13-year-old child comes to the uncle who loves him, says to him, I would want to go and die for you. Hussein ibn Ali looked at him and said, Oh Qasim, whenever I miss my brother Hassan, I just have a look at you. Who will I look at after you go, Oh Qasim? Qasim says, my mother has asked me to seek permission from you. Imam Hussein says, no Qasim, there is no permission for you. I am still alive. Abbas is still there. Qasim goes disappointed to the mother and says, oh mother, Imam Hussein, the uncle is not allowing me to go. At that time, Umm Farwa, at that time, Umm Farwa remembers that there is a letter that was given to her by Imam Hassan. And Imam Hassan had told her that the day will come when it will be immense Shiddat and trouble at that particular time. Take my letter and go give it to Hussein ibn Ali, my brother. When Umm Farwa looked at this letter, she took it out. She gave it to Qasim and she said, Oh, my son Qasim, take this letter to your uncle and go and show it to him. Qasim took the letter. He went to Hussein's camp. He went and he said, Oh, uncle, I have this letter for you. Hussein ibn Ali looked at the letter. He opened the letter. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Oh my brother Hussein, this is the time that I want you to sacrifice my son Qasim on you. I shall not be there when you receive this letter, oh my brother Hussein. But my Qasim will be there and I wish you and I want you to send him to the battlefields to be for you. The moment Hussein ibn Ali read that letter, he looked at Qasim with eyes filled with love and tears. He looked at Qasim and said, Oh my son Qasim, taqaddam ya bunayya. Go my son Qasim, go. According to certain riwayats, it is also narrated that Imam Hussein put a shirt on Qasim and he tore the shirt from the top. This meant that he was telling Qasim, oh my son Qasim, I am sending you with your kafan, oh my son Qasim. <laughs> For he knows what's going to happen to Qasim. He picks the child up. He picks the child up and puts him on the horse and says, Oh Qasim, may Allah protect you. Go. Qasim goes towards the battlefield. His feet are not even reaching, reaching the saddles. 
he goes to the battlefield he fights a very gallant fight he kills a few individuals he kills a few kuffar but then there come a time when there was he was he was wearing a shoe and there were laces in the shoe one of the riwayat narrates and it made me cry when i read this riwayat janab e qasim just went down to tie the shoe lace at that time someone struck him at the back he fell down on the ground and said assalamu alayka ya amma oh my uncle peace be upon you the moment hussein ibn ali heard the voice he rushed rushed towards the battlefield and when the enemy saw that hussein is coming with abbas like a lion raging what they did was there was a chaos between them they started running away and in the process of running away qasim's body began to be trampled by the hooves of the horses You know, each shahid, when they were falling down to the ground, they used to call Hussein ibn Ali once or twice. Ya Aba Abdullah, Assalamu alaikum Ya Aba Abdullah. Janabe Qasim, every time he was trampled, used to say Ya Aba Abdullah. Oh my uncle save me oh my uncle help me every time the hooves trampled on him he used to call on Hussein ibn Ali when the dust fell down when everybody were moved away Hussein ibn Ali is looking for Qasim Hussein is looking and searching for Qasim suddenly he sees that the body of Qasim is so trampled unrecognizable He was a child but now he had lengthened his body. Hussein ibn Ali goes to Janab Qasim, picks him up, his chest with his chest as he pulls him and takes him towards the tent. Qasim's feet are dragging in the ground. He cries on Abbas and says, "Ya Abbas, the son of my brother has gone. Ya Abbas, look at what they have done to Qasim." He reaches towards the tent and calls on Zainab and says, "Oh Zainab, your Qasim has been trampled by the horses." Umm Farwa hears this and says, "Ya Qasim, oh Qasim, I had wishes for you. I wanted you to become a fine man, oh Qasim. Ya Qasim." 